Our program this morning will be a conversation. This is a man whose face and name you no, may not recognize, but you're sure to recognize the names and faces of the people he's photographed. John Minahan is from County Kildare, just not too far from here. At 21, he became the youngest staff photographer at the Evening Standard, and from there he has had an illustrious career photographing the famous and the infamous from fashion, theater, film, and other celebrities, you're going to recognize his body of work. This morning, we welcome him to the stage for a conversation with our own Alistair McKenzie to talk about what goes into making some of these iconic black and white photos. Please join me in welcoming to the stage acclaimed Irish photographer, John Minahan, who is here courtesy of our sponsorship by Kildare Village Chic Outlet Shopping in conversation this morning with Alistair McKenzie. We're going to really enjoy this, I think, uh, this morning. Um, John is, has a wealth of experience uh, and is, as Mary Jo has just said, uh, uh, has a, a fantastic uh, legacy of uh, photographs and images to, to talk about. When Mary asked me to do this uh, interview, she said, well, we want to talk, because we talk so often about the, the technicalities of being, <coughs> excuse me, being bloggers and journalists and monetization and stuff like that. And we want to talk about craft, and I think you're going to find uh, there's a lot of craft uh, in, in John here. John uh, has been, as Mary said, uh, f a photographer for many years and was born, in fact, in Dublin, weren't you? That's, it wasn't that's correct. I was born uh, at the Rotunda Hospital down here. Um, and very quickly then moved to Athai. Yeah, yeah, very quickly. I spent the first eight years of my life in Athai, County Kildare. And that was, uh, you were, actually you are the original baby boomer, aren't you? Because this was 19, I hate to say this, but this was 1946, thereabouts? Well, you know, I took a taxi ride around the rotunda yesterday and I saw a group of ladies smoking their cigarettes outside the hospital. It made me think a lot <laughs> <laughs> about being here. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. But, uh, you know, I thought really it was the, the, you know, the formative time of my, uh, you know, grow, uh, growing up was in Athai County. I think that's where some of the images were really implanted and have never left me. You weren't there for long because you, you moved, I think, age 12 across the water. Eight, eight, eight. Oh, yeah, eight and nine. I left. I went to yeah. To 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 London, mm. uh, and then very quickly got your first job, and that's really where it it kind of mm. kicks off for you. But was photography something you were interested in before you even started with your first photographer's job? Well, it was actually because you know living in the thigh, the most important thing to you know living in a sort of uh, rural Irish town was the cinema. You know, the three things you're familiar with is is your faith. The, the church obviously was very much grounded into you. But the leisure time for a young man growing up, a young boy for me, was, th was the cinema. And I always remember the kind of uh, Art Deco style cinema in a thigh called the Savoy. And before I ever knew about New York or Paris or anything, you know, those images were on the screen. I used to go in there on a Sunday, a Sunday afternoon and watch the light going, you know, just <laughs> um, projected onto a white screen and, you know, lit up with smoke and everything and just people completely sort of captivated by imagery on the screen. So I, I, I was always interested in, uh, in film, and I was always interested, I want to go there, I want to go to New York, I want to look at this skyscraper. And, uh, that, and uh, that's where your interest in, in both imagery and also in the characters, of course, of the, uh, of the film world, but also in the arts and culture as well, because you've always been drawn to arts and culture, to Irish poetry, to stuff like, to all those, those elements of your uh, upbringing here in Ireland. Exactly. Well, you know, growing up in a small Irish town, um, you know, poetry and song and your faith, it's really very much part of you. But particularly literature, you know, I was very, very aware of, uh, you know, a thigh and its connection to literature. Like James Joyce in Portrait of the Artist as a young man uh, has the two characters walking on a beach in Dublin. And one says to the other, what part of the body is called after an Irish town? A thigh which interests me, it's a very joystick kind of thing like. But, but also the great Irish poet Paddy Kavanagh um, 
has a poem, uh, and it's not too far from the Burlington here, there's a, there's a sort of statue, there's a kind of bench dedicated to Paddy Kavanaugh, but Paddy actually wrote this poem called Lions Written on a Canal Se Seat, about a thigh, talking about barges bringing from a thigh to malt, because the thigh was one of the first malt houses to bring the, 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 the wheat up to uh, the, the Guinness, St. James's Gate. So I, I was very familiar with it. And of course, the smells. I mean, when you live in a small town, the Guinness, the pizza, the, all these things really sort of impacted on me. I so knew you were going to say that, that I actually brought Paddy <laughs> Kavanagh's book, and I've got a bookmark here on, the, on that particular poem. It's a, uh, this, this is something, uh, as John says, if you have a chance, uh, then when you come out of this hotel, you turn right down the road. When you get to the canal, which is only a five-minute walk away, go f over the bridge and down that side, and you'll come to... Uh, this bench that, uh, that Paddy Kavanagh uh, wrote about. It, he, he wanted to be commemorated sitting on a bench by this lock, which mm. Niagara'sly roars. And if you, you see this, this lock, and it's just it's got a you know, trickle of water that goes over it. But in the summer, it's, uh, it, is, it is Niagara's, and uh, it's definitely worth, worth doing. And there's a, this statue of him sat there, something that's absolutely worth it. And as you say, he mentioned in the poem the barges coming up from the town of uh, Athai. Athai. Mm. So, so grateful for James Joyce, because I was looking. Athai is actually written Athi for anybody who wants to look it up on a map. So uh, yeah. he's, gi he's given us the clue on how to spell but, it. But th that was also the beginning, because from a very early age, I was interested in the collaboration between photography and literature. You know, I mean, writers and photographers are, are, are kind of soulmates. And I mean, this goes right back to Nadar's uh, photographs of Baudelaire and uh, Julia Margaret Cameron's pictures of Alfred Lord Tennyson and uh, brass size collaboration with Henry Miller. And then, of course, you've got the Joyce thing, which is L. Freud. And to some degree, I always think if people see my pictures of Samuel Beckett, it will give an interest to my pictures of a thigh. Because in this, you know, where culture has such a short shelf life today, certain things that I regard as important, you know, tend to maybe disappear a little bit. And, um, of course, when you have something as such a gigantic figure as Samuel Beckett, whose work will always be performed, always mm -hmm. will endure then there'll always be a reference to a thigh. And that really makes me happy. So I, I kind of, I'm a photographer who, who's interested in working with writers, and um, that's, that's still important to me. We'll come back to both uh, Samuel Beckett uh, and a thigh. Uh, but for now, we've arrived in London. You joined the Daily Mail at uh, age 17. In uh, uh, 16. Six, 16. Yeah. Uh, and you went into, it was a photographic apprenticeship, and you were in the darkroom. That's correct, yeah. In the darkroom, to do an apprenticeship for five years in the darkroom, my job solely, I mean, first of all, I was paid very little money. I think it was like 50 shillings a week, but um, that was generally the norm. But my job consisted of replenishing the, news, the, the, the paper lockers, mm -hmm. Kodak or Ilford, uh, making up the chemicals. I mean, all this kind of alchemy, which... There's a photograph of you looking very young uh, mm. uh, alongside a row of stainless steel drums. Are those, uh, that, what are those? Are those the the yeah, they were the drums that you would dry the prints with. So you'd oh. have maybe, uh, you know, hundreds of uh, 10 by 8 images on, you know, what I like, you know, when I think, when you mention that, I think about feeling, you know, because a lot of people look today, but nobody, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not here to mystify technology, but just to make people look, because, you know, see rather than look, because... Coming down, you see people with their cameras taking pictures, and I wonder sometimes, you know, if people are really uh, seen. That's why I love the feel of those papers and the chemicals and all that stuff. I think we should talk about some of the, those, those technicalities and, and the benefits and the things that we've, we've sort of lost along the way and the things that we've gained along the way. But just for now, I'd be very interested to know how many of you um, uh, consider yourselves to be photographers in that you need to support your blog work and the, and the like. So how many, how many people uh, uh, are photographers? Have we got a good... What, 50%? And how many of you um, have actually worked uh, before digital? In other words, how many of you have loaded film in and developed it and been in dark rooms and all that? Oh, that's good, actually. That's quite a good, good spread. Good. So this will mean a, a, a lot to you guys uh, because in the dark room there, you had to, I mean, there's something special about a dark room anyway. You have to take us through the process. You, you, you come back with your film. Yeah, well, what happens is I'm in the dark room all the time, you know, sort of seven days a week. But the, you're working for a newspaper, and the newspaper at that time had like 20 photographers thereabouts. But then you had regional photographers as well. You know, so if something happened anywhere in the world, London, the Daily Mail, people, I would, would be, I would be processing film from royal photographers, sports photographers, feature photographers, show business photographers, 
everybody that had their own little niche, you know. And fashion photographers, I remember at the time, you know, uh, developing a lot of stuff for, uh, uh, of John French. Now, John French was one of the early fashion photographers. And of course, and, and like John Cowan, John Cowan's studio was the actual studio that was used when uh, Antonioni made that film Blow Up. Yeah. Which I think was probably the first time that one saw a film about the swinging 60s where fashion and photography, suddenly the photographer and the model, that was it. That was, was suddenly became rock and roll at that point. Heady mix. Huh? A heady mix. A heady right mix, actually. actually, that's right. And, and great fun. So I'm actually watching, uh, you know, developing these films. And of course, also I'm there in 1963 when um, you had wire machines, you know, coming in from yes. Associated Press. Yeah. And I'm actually looking at, uh, holding in my hand a, 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 a wire photograph of the assassination of uh, President John F. Kennedy. And, you know, you're not just, you suddenly you realize, well, I didn't realize at the time, but now when I look back, you know, I'm, I'm sort mm -hmm. of participating in history and of course I'm having to hold this picture and then copy it it's coming in from Dallas or uh, yeah and I have to copy it to bring more contrast to the to, to the image so that it then can be transmitted to the regional yeah. offices in Edinburgh in Glasgow and Manchester so it was all this kind of stuff and then of course the football stuff you know the sport and of course the royal things that were happening at the time so I was actually uh, with my little sort of mitts um, touching history 24 yeah, literally all the time, you know. This is, <coughs> the wires were pre-Instagram and, and the rest. What, what happened was you'd, you'd take a photograph, you'd develop it, you'd print it, and you'd stick it on a drum. And, th and then and the drum would rotate, and there'd be a little yeah. light that would shine. Exactly, out, and, and it, it could take it seven to ten minutes. Dots and dashes mm. up, the, up the line to, you know, to London or to, to New York or wherever it might be. And at the other end, there would be another piece of photographic paper that was running in sync, and that light would be flashing onto it in dots and dashes. And did you, with ten minutes? Yeah, it would vary from it could, you know, to receive the picture could take 10 minutes. They just said, they make a phone call, say, you know, to picture editors, we're waiting for the picture, and everybody, what size would it make? Will it make a two, six column by four by two inches deep? It was all this kind of language, which yeah. is a lovely language. Yeah. And, uh, you know, newspaper offices then with phones ringing, there was shirt sleeve men and women running around the place, and it was just a, you know, n what real newspaper offices were. And so, so much room for, for error, because, you know, th this would be undeveloped paper that you'd put on your drum to receive the image on, and mm. then you'd have to go and redevelop it again. Exactly. Put it's it in a yeah, bath yeah, of, uh, yeah. of developer, mm. and then mm. put it in the stop mm. bath, and then mm. put it in the fixer, mm. and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, mm. make, turn it into a picture, and you'd get it wrong. You know, the guy could have sent you a perfect image of the Kennedy assassination, yeah, well, you know, Kennedy assassination, and of course, the Jack Ruby thing, and but all things wonderful. I remember on one occasion seeing, which was really wonderful, one of my favorite sort of photographers of nature, an American man called Ansel Adams. I'm sure some of the uh, uh, photographers here would know this name. But I remember uh, one of the Im one of his images of moonlight over Hernandez was being sold at Sotheby's in New York, and it came across, and it was the most perfect image anyone who knows the image in fact it's just such a beautiful um, picture of nature and this picture came across saying this image is it was printed I think in 1958 or something like that, but it was being sold uh, in Sotheby's uh, in New York and it just came off the drum and it was as perfect I actually kept it for a while and then somebody tea leafed it it's gone out of my sort of thing but it was just what, such a wonderful piece of beauty even on a sort of, you know, in the world then, which we're in now, which is, you know, escalating at such a pace, but even then, like, <laughs> pictures coming across. But this was like what I call the silence of the still, you know, because sometimes you just want silence. And when I look at sort of um, still photographs, I, you know, for me, that's the silence. And that certainly was a great evocation of that sort of sense of the silence of the still. That's you at this early stage as in a sense, a sort of a, 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 an observer, a, to an extent a participant. But it's really at this point you begin to start creating yourself. And the very first time, speaking of the, the sense of silence, uh, is this trip, this photograph here. Um, tell, take us through this. This is the uh, this uh, is a balls. Th yeah, during my lunch <coughs> hours as an apprentice, um, Fleet Street was like, the, the, the two newspapers in Fleet Street were the Daily Telegraph, and the Daily Express, and sometimes at midnight, I could walk down Fleet Street, and you could virtually feel the earth move. You'd understand this, Alice, with the, with the drums just beating out the, the first editions. Like It was just amazing. But in my lunch hours, I would go to St. Paul's Cathedral, which was just the most beautiful. You can imagine a young man coming from Ireland, and all of a sudden, 
I'm just there. And St. Paul's Cathedral, I go and have lunch. And I remember one of the sort of porters in St. Paul's, I was sitting down, he said, have you ever been to the Whispering Gallery? Because I never realized there was a Whispering Gallery in St. Paul's. So I went, traipsed up the stairs to the, to the gallery. And of course, I had a, my, my uh, camera, which was, a, this is a Rolleiflex. I had a Yashika mat, which is a Japanese copy of the Rolleiflex. And um, uh, as I entered the, gal the, the Whispering Gallery, I saw these two men with their hands cut. And again, I was just, you know, because down below, the people in downstairs in, in the St. Paul's, their voices would echo through the gallery, and these two men just listening. And it was just beautiful, but also the curvature of the shadows and the light. You know, my eyes were being feasted with the sort of beauty of imagery in black and white. And um, to this day, I mean, you know, I'm not a photographer who's interested in photorealism, so to speak, but to me, it, that's the real deal. I love that, and these two men, and of course, the symmetry of the pictures where they're, they're just, their heads just meet the line there, You're, they actually talk, take you through it. So that was in a sense, I took this photograph, went back to the, to the darkroom, processed it myself, and then I printed it. And of course, um, a friend of mine said, you should send it to a newspaper, and you know, anyway, it ended up winning five guineas as the <laughs> picture of the week in the Evening Standard. So it was my first publication. It's a lot of money. In those days, and I five guineas was a lot of money. As I told you this morning, <laughs> it bought, uh, Alistair said, what would you do with the money? Or Brian said, I said, I bought a, a mohair suit. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I first had my first sense of vanity. I bought a mohair suit. What color? And I had hair as well. Huh? <laughs> um, yeah, I remember the color, in fact. It was a kind of sparkling kind. It looked like it had been worn for 100 years, but it, it, was, it, was, it, it was a kind of blue, yeah. bluish mohair suit. And I really thought I was the dude in the rock. And as I said, it was, it was the 60s. It was rock and roll. That's, uh, it is an iconic photograph, and you were so lucky to, to get that thing. I, I, I'm not sure if we fully explained that the, the, the whole point about <coughs> the Whispering Gallery is that uh, it's in the dome of St. Paul's, and it's because of the shape of the dome that you get this acoustic effect where if you sit on those benches, you can hear what is being said down uh, in, the, in the nave. And um, uh, it is a, a, an absolutely beautiful photograph that, and so lucky to get the, the light right. Let's go back to sort of basics again now, because uh, all the time you're having to work as a photographer with light. I mean, when you come to a scene like this, it's, you know, we know churches, we do churches all the time, don't mm. we guys? They're gloomy places. <coughs> How do you make this work? I think to make it work, well, I was very familiar with churches uh, growing up in the thigh. Uh, in fact, I still am, actually. Um, you know, I still have, have a sense of, I like the idea, as I said, I like the peace and I like the tranquility of walking into a, a church and just um, thinking. But I knew about the light and obviously working in the darkroom, it's like um, Samuel Beckett said, ever try it, ever fail, fail again, fail better. There's no such a thing as perfection, not in my game in terms of, you know, you do fail. And, um, but I, I knew enough about the light, in fact, and the film I was using, the Tri-X. I always like Kodak Tri-X film. And I just, by, by, just, l by just looking at the, 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 the situation, I could tell the light. It was a <laughs> sixth of a second at 5.6, which I always think is the best part of the camera. But also I bracketed the exposures because I had the luxury of going back into the darkroom and developing, so I had a feeling that somewhere in the line where we were right. And I didn't want to draw too much attention to myself with the gentlemen who were, to this day, after 50 years or so, I don't know, I never saw these yeah. two gentlemen's faces. I don't know what connection they have. You know, every story, as I say, to every picture tells a story, and of course there's a story that these two gentlemen, you know, even the way they're dressed and their suits and their sh shoes and their, together, just listening to what they no, said. No model release forms then? In that day, no model release forms, absolutely not. I have no time for them. But you're, you're, it's funny because we, we, you and I were uh, at the Jameson's uh, yeah. last, uh, the night before last, and uh, one of the photographers came round, one of the guys who'd been photographing us at all, all the opportunities, and they, he took this shot of, of us and then walked away. And you and I looked at each other at that moment. It's because, uh, you know, if you're a press man, you don't walk away. You need the names. You need to know, you know who they are, um, mm. how, they, how it's spelt, um, all, of, all of those kind of details. Mm. And, and th all of that's 
that has changed enormously, but it brings us on to, and probably now is a good moment to go to uh, the, the, the next uh, image we've got here, which is, this is uh, the, the who. Um, it, it brings us on to that business of relationships, of forming a relationship between the photographer and, and, and the subjects. Tell us about this, uh, this photograph. Well, um, this photograph uh, of the who uh, embarking just about before they were, they were about to explode on the world, of the innocence of these four young men from Sierpus Bush, and they, they uh, in Soho in London, there's this uh, club called the Marquee Club, which uh, from Monday to uh, Saturday um, had various bands, like the Faces or the Who, and of course the Who started there. And this is just um, before they go on stage, and you can see the, the, the two characters left to right, you know, the two, John N. Whistler and Keith Moon, and now passed on. And again, it's like that shape. We have the shape. It's the, this, is, this is the Yashika Mad camera. And I, I built up a... Because I needed to earn money to, 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 as an apprentice. I, I wasn't just content to... It couldn't live. And there was, a, uh, there was a kind of flotilla of magazines, you might remember them called, you know, uh, New Music Express, The Melody Maker, Disc. And I started actually photographing the bands that were just about you know, erupting at the time, like The Who and The Kinks and stuff, and many other people because it was a means of giving me extra sort of money. And of course, magazines like Disc and Melly Met would use my pictures. And I one of my favorite bands at the time was, was The Animals. I remember when they disbanded, Chas Chandler um, telling me about, um, he brought back from America this young guitarist called Jimi Hendrix. And I was one of the first people to, f to photograph Hendrix. I was 20 years of age, it was February 1967. And you can see Jimi here, he's actually by, by a, a, a doorknob in, in, um, in, in London. The interesting thing about this picture was, it, so I had an agent uh, back in Belgium at that time, and, and I sent my nags to this man and stuff, and they had disappeared, and some prints. I suddenly got this picture back uh, in February this year, of, or March, and I'd done this journey since 1967, and when I have, and I have the print, when I feel the picture, you know, it's amazing, that stippo bromide gelatin print. I think it's I astonishing that it's, th it, it's still, it's still there because it, unless well, you did your job well in the darkroom you, you, and fixed well, it properly, the chance right. it, well, it would go brown. On the back of the print, it has my stamp, John J. Min and Barons Court, London, and my telephone number at the time. This is the wonderful thing about film: the sense of, you know, ownership. You know, because I'm I'm now just beginning to learn a little bit about the digital world. And as I said, the nearest I get to digital is the, the disc that's actually showing my images here. <laughs> um, but I, I I I love this sense that. It, but it's again, it's like Julie Margaret Cameron. I mean, we're still looking at her pictures, nearly 200. I mean, next year, photography will be 175 years mm. um, oh, since yeah. it was invented by Louis de Gur. I mean, there were a few other people, but Louis de Gur is credited as the man who, who arrested the light. And I'm still fascinated by the fact that, you know, we, we have these, you know, I'm dealing in film, but I mean, it's, that, it's that still there, you know, that's kind of stuff. Film, you still have to source because you still walk around. Every time I've seen you, you've got a, a medium format camera of one shape or another. You never really were you big into 35 millimeter? Or? Well, oh yeah, I mean, in, you know, working for, for for newspapers like the Daily Mail, and I was covering stories at 35 mil because it's much faster. Mm. Uh, obviously, if you were covering a, a you know a riot or a photo call or a football match, you, you know these are. This is my leisure time. This is my thinking camera. And the other camera was something else, you know, because it was uh, what it was. But I mean, wander around Dublin, in fact, literally Dublin with a Rolleiflex. I mean, it's still Joycey in Dublin here. It still fascinates me that there's a hotel in Nassau Street where James Joyce waited while his his girlfriend, Nora Barnacle, I mean, with a name like Barnacle, <laughs> who said she stuck to him for life. Um, <laughs> But you know, that hotel is still there. It's, I think it's called Finn's Hotel, and you can just see it actually, just by Trinity College there. And that fascinates me to extract a little bit of history. Again, you know, the literature and Joyce, as I said, is still there. We've come back to, uh, to Ireland, uh, and you came back very quickly to uh, Athai. On a regular basis, I think every year you would come back, and you built up a formidable collection of photographs of the residents. Uh, of a thigh, uh, local characters and, and people like that, and you put together a collection. This is probably one of your uh, best-known images. Uh, tell me about this one. This is the funeral. In fact, you took a lot of images around this particular event, didn't you? 
I did. Well, you know, in the dark room, seeing pictures coming in, people from around the place, I, I was f very interested in photography, and I, again, I got to realize um, Edward S. Curtis and his wonderful uh, essay on the North American Indian. But I realized that, you know, going, you know, when you're in London, if you're an Irishman, you're always going home. You know, Ireland was home. And um, in 1962, I went back to a Thai, and one of my cousins was getting married but he couldn't afford to have a photographer. I said, I'll do the pictures. And um, I realized at that, around that moment, look, you know, this is my backyard. I'm gonna just photograph the tradition in which I came from. And this particular picture here, I mean, it, it's small Irish town. What gives a town its character? Only the people. And it's really about love, life, and death. And the death thing particularly is interesting. It goes like, it's like Beckett, one of these things born astride of a grave. We're born and we're gonna die. That is the only reality in between all that. But you know, this just fascinated me. And of course in 1977, I'm in a thigh, it's February, it's cold, and where I would normally go and drink, I'd always wanted to photograph uh, the wake because the wake for me is the heartbeat and its tentacles go out because we're all during the journey gonna lose somebody we love, we care about. And um, on this particular morning at 10 o'clock, Mr. Bertie Doyle, in fact, the Doyle's bar had told me that Mrs. Tyrrell had passed away during the early hours of the morning. I remember it was a Monday morning. And I was given permission to go into the home, meet the family, and take the... Now, this was a ritual that over two nights and three days, it was the dying art of dying. My camera was witnessing something that for me, it's the most important sequence of photographs I've ever taken in my life, because through these pictures, now when you read a photograph, like we read a book, or you should be able to, when I talk to young photographers about, it's about reading, it's about looking, but seeing, really understanding. When you look at that photograph, and you see, when you look at the picture, you see there's a lady called Mrs. Tyrrell in the wake room. Above her is a, is a kind of sepia tone photograph of a, of a daughter who'd passed away earlier in her life. The right-hand side of the picture there, there's a, there's a mirror shrouded with a white sheet because part of the mythology is look at me for you're looking at reflection of yourself for death is the beginning. So I had all this information and these pictures would, um, would be absolutely instrumental in me meeting and photographing Samuel Beckett, arguably one of the greatest dramatists in the world because I'd, I'd known enough about Sam's work to know that you don't just photograph Beckett, you offer him some, because Sam would love a voice or a face. And so, as if by magic. And as if by magic. Here, here we are, it's probably, but one of the, th you're, you're known for your collection of works for uh, a thigh, and in fact you were made, a, I think you were made a, given the freedom of the city, weren't you, in 1991? Uh, well, actually, it's, actually, I'd be very happy that you called it a city in a thigh. It's a small little town, but, yeah, but thank you. Well, it's yeah. actually, but yeah, actually. But you, you've dedicated your life yeah, to picking it up, haven't and you? And a thigh is actually part of, it's now part of Dublin suburbia, because when I was there, it was like yeah. three hours to get to a thigh. I mean, some people I photograph had never been to Dublin. So they, they, they commute now, it's 35, 40 minutes on, on a... Samuel on a Beckett place. gets um, the Nobel Prize, and you realise that this is a, a, a moment when uh, nobody has any good photographs of him. Well, I do. I mean, it was a very... It was a summer in 1969. I'm in, I'm in on the editorial floor of the Evening Standard, and some backbench sub screams across the picture desk. He's holding a piece of folio of paper saying, some obscure Irishman in Paris <laughs> has just won the Nobel Prize for Literature. As if that was something rather strange, you know, probably it is. I mean, you know, if you win the Nobel Prize for Literature, you're British in some respects, you know. I mean, as mm -hmm. a, a, our late, great, rather passed away recently, Seamus Heaney, Seamus who won, was a recipient. But, uh, you know, he was called a British poet, wins the Nobel Prize. In fact, Seamus was very, very Irish. And um, as indeed Sam was, he always had an Irish passport. But I'm on the editorial floor, and uh, as I said, the backbench sub, I went to the library, and there was no photographs of Mr. Beckett in Paris, this reclusive uh, avant-garde Irishman. But lots of clippings about his work. And I thought, at that moment in time, I thought, this, I, you know, I, I, I must track this man down. And you showed him your collection of uh, photographs of a thigh. Well, and that, that's what turned the corner and allowed you to build up really a very uh, long-lasting relationship with him. You, you photographed him at, at many different I, events. I, I did. He came to London in 1980. I had 10 years in, in, in thinking about him, looking at his work and reading about him. And, and, I, and when he came to London in 1980, 
he came over from Paris and he stayed at the Hyde Park Hotel and um, he was he was directing uh, his work uh, Endgame at that particular time. And I left a note in saying I was an Irish photographer and I wanted to photograph him and knowing in fact that I was told he wasn't in the hotel. But anyway, I um, phoned up the next day and I was put through to his room and, and Sam expressed the wish to see my photographs. And th in particular, the, the sequence on the wake. Now I knew Sam might be interested in that side because one of his great buddies in Paris, of course, was James Joyce. They were, you know, um, I think uh, Samuel Beckett um, would visit Joyce two or three times a week in Paris and would read to him, you know, and uh, it was interesting. So that's what actually happened. The next day I got down to the hotel. I was expecting this um, man to come down to the lobby to greet me and go through the normal things and, you know, um, but no, the, the graciousness about this man was he invited me up to his room, room 604. Now, even in the world of Beckett, room 604 is important to me because it was a back room where he used to look over the Hyde Park, because in the 30s he used to walk around there. Because when you're actually engaging, you're photographing a writer. I mean, I, I will read a book from the author as I tell mm -hmm. a young photographer. Mm -hmm. Don't just go, today it's no disrespect, but when you see, take a picture, look at the back, got it, that's the end of it. It's never the end of it. Because you know, a sixth of a second is nothing out of anybody's life. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna photograph an author, Read his books. You might find he likes working on an Olivetti typewriter with a, with, a, with a rubber plant behind his head. These are important. This, is, this mm -hmm. is what gives a narrative to pictures. Otherwise, we just get a kind of, what a kind of trolley load road of, of, of shite, which means nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And, it built, and it builds and establishes that relationship, which enables you to go from his hotel room and taking, there's a lovely photograph you've got of his, of his hands, just his hands holding his glasses. Yeah, I don't think we have it in this. Exactly, series. yeah, that's and, right. And, and, but, it, but from there on to uh, f filming him, in this mm. case, in, in, in Paris, yeah. this was a couple well, of years later. Yeah, that's this right. is the definitive yeah. shot. Yeah. He's got a fabulous face. I love, you know, it, it's, it's deeply lined yeah. and craggy. I mean, you must have been. Yeah. Well, this was, in 19, this was December 1985, as I said. I photographed him in 1980, and I photographed him in London 1984. And of course, I, I was also photographing the productions of the work, Endgame, Godot, Crafts, Last Tape. I mean, every major actor in the world today wants to play Beckett. You know, I mean, this is just the case now. At the time, it was like little theaters off Broadway <laughs> in Paris, and uh, you know, even little pub theaters in, in London, Irish actors out of work, find a tree in the park, get the bowler hats, put it together, because the work is beautiful to photograph. Let's, uh, let's talk actors. Um, Richard Burton, I mean, here's Richard Burton, the first voice in uh, Under Milk Wood, Dylan Thomas, one of my favorite poets. And of course, Dylan and Richard Burton were drinking buddies. They just loved going out for the crack and enjoying themselves. And of course, Burton, all his life, was such a devout and so proudly Welsh Celt. He, he just loved to be part of that whole thing. And of course, this is Richard, um, the first voice in on, on Under Milkwood, which was a radio play written for, uh, for in fact, performed at the at the Y in New York. Like, and there's wonderful photographs, incidentally, I just mentioned by the American photographer Raleigh McKenna, so-called Raleigh after the Raleigh flex. But she photographed Dylan with a cigarette in his mouth, and he's directing. Of course, here you see Richard Burton holding the cigarette. It's not PC these days to see. We don't often see this, but he's holding the scripts. And of course, if anybody un knows Burton's voice or hears them reading. I was just mentioned this morning over breakfast, <coughs> yesterday in the Daily Telegraph, Prince Charles has just recorded Dylan Thomas's Fern Hill, because it's the next year is the uh, 100th anniversary of the birth of Dylan. But of course, no disrespect to Prince Charles, but his voice, I mean, he's really, I mean, you know, when you hear Richard Burton reading Dylan, it just g still gives me goose pimples when I hear him reading, do not go gentle into that good night. But um, Prince Charles reading Fern Hill, it's, uh, it's fine, but um, People this don't is the thing. That's your controversial tweet there. <laughs> the, people don't think that, uh, that photographs do sound, but this photograph does sound, doesn't it? You can, you can hear his voice in there. You can hear the, 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 you, the cigarette and everything else. You, th this does that, mm. that low tone, that somber sound that he had in black and white. Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, you know, it, it works, for me, it works in black and white. It's like the wake. I mean, you know, there's a theatricality about color which doesn't work for death for me. Mm. And of course, some people say, well, you know, have you got any color pictures? That was no, 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 no. 
you know, I love that somebody used this sense of black and white. I always remember as a young, as a five-year-old in a thigh, if somebody passed away in, in, on, in Pluman's Terrace, there was a little, little mass card, a memoriam card stuck on the door with a rather muzzy black and white photograph of a loved one. Mm -hmm. And of course, I love that. And of course, that's what the photograph is. It, it is a memoriam. I mean, today now, of course, when people look at digital cameras, one of the words that comes up is delete. If you don't like me, get rid of me. But of course, with, yeah. with film, you have the sense of longevity. I mean, I am still ha you know, looking at strips of film I took yeah. in 62. But also, th th this is a photograph, uh, you, when we originally talked, this is one coming up now that I loved, and I'm so pleased you've now uh, managed to find it and, and put it <laughs> into here. This is Alfred Hitchcock in, uh, in, in London, and uh, I, I love, uh, it's the characters behind him as much as anything else. They're actually, the, the larger image of this version of this, there's a policeman, isn't there? Somewhere? Oh, no, he's there, over the, sh over the shoulder. Yeah. There's some really fascinating uh, people in there. And, and uh, you kind of forget that what you're doing all the time is uh, you're meeting all these extraordinary people because you are a press photographer. That's, that's what drives it. And so you're seeing extraordinary people in extraordinary places, but you're also... This is the sort of the happy side of what you do, but there's, there's also the sad side, because you, you would be, have to be sent off to go and film you know, tragedies, or uh, I think you were talking to me at, at breakfast about the, the, the Welsh miners' mm. uh, 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 tragedy where, where, where several well, miners... Well, a lot of the stories, I mean, you know, I was very aware as an apprentice that, you know, photographers who join newspapers, sometimes they're quite happy to be given assignment sheets. I was never quite happy. I mean, there's a lot of photographers work on newspapers, and you know, and there's always a kind of, you know, there's a, there's a kind of um, situation where, you know, I've always been used to reading papers and finding my own stories. Or as an Irish photographer, people would tell me things. Now, this particular picture here uh, came together because I had a friend of mine who was a barman in the pub on the corner there called the Marquis of Granby. And he said, John, there's a lot of filming going on here. Now, he didn't know what was going on, but as soon as he said there was, there was filming going on and there was a lot of police activity around at the time, I was very interested. Because it was also a time at the, you know, 1971 when, you know, uh, the IRA were bombing London. So any time I was told I would be there because that was part. But when I got there, I realized, of course, it was Alfred Hitchcock making one of his last films in London called Frenzy. But how you actually sort of design the picture, like when I'm looking, like with the Rolleiflex, I'm governed to, if I'm looking at you, Alice, I'm looking at what's around you. Mm. I'm designing the picture. So when I went down here and I was waiting and I knew it was Alfred Hitchcock, because it's Bow Street and there's a policeman and, you know, the Bow Street runners and because you have, it was Covent Garden, so you've, you've got one of the uh, porters, Covent Garden porters, it was all there, you know, and I, and I liked that. It was just taking Alfred Hitchcock away from sort of, uh, uh, you know, his sort of Los Angeles type of um, setting, yeah. setting. And here he was in London. I mean, he, he was English, actually, wasn't he? I think he was born in London or something like that. But you don't... Do you do you know that moment when you've got... There's a photograph that we're going to come to shortly. I'm going to actually skip through a few of them to get to, to the one I'm thinking of. Um, but you're, when you take the photograph, do you know you've got it? Because unlike today, you, you just look at the back and you go, well... Yeah. Well, no, I, I know. I mean, you, I... So you develop absolutely. it. You have no idea. No, but I, I, this is the wonderful thing. It's about love. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, then it was like, you know, sort of... Uh, it was love. I knew there was a latent image in my cat. You, I mean, you know when you're looking at through the lens, you know, and you're seeing, I mean, I am anyway, I can't speak for everybody else, but for me, in fact, I just, you know, I just, even now, I get ex excited about looking at things, and and I knew when I saw that, I could see the porter, I could see the policeman, and I could see the Marcus of Granby, and, and more importantly, Alfred Hitchcock, Mr. Hitchcock, of course, I mean, I love the fact that, 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 that I just love the, 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 the this man of, uh, <laughs> walking with his, with his suit, kind of, it wasn't quite my mohair suit, you know, yeah, but yeah, uh, <laughs> it's really kind of stretched up and this incredibly powerful figure in motion pictures. There's nothing really you can do afterwards, you can't patch it up. I'm just going to move on to the, uh, the, to the, the next one we've got in the collection uh, here because um, this is Francis Bacon and, and uh, again, this is a, a good relationship you formed and, and we're able to shoot him on several occasions. But uh, I, I was just thinking about the that business of looking at it and thinking, I, I think I've got it there. I think I've, that, that, that's going to work for, for me. Um, but if you, when you get back to, this, to the dark room and you develop it and you realize that there is you know, something sticking out of his hair, mm. in those days you, you had the <laughs> techniques to be able to, to tweak or to... Well, you know, to be honest with you, um, no, I wasn't that sort of uh, 
geared up and stuff like that. I mean, obviously, you know, there, there were things you did, burning in, doing things, and, you know, it's not quite as it is today, but... We um, were talking on the phone a, a few days ago and realized that uh, we knew, uh, we had a friend in common, Roger Bray, who for years uh, was the travel editor of the uh, Evening Standard. Lovely, lovely man. Roger tells me a, a nice tale. There was another photographer, Ken Towner. Mm, okay, and Roger, yeah. Roger walked into the canteen at the... Um, uh, the Evening Standard, and there's, there's Ken standing, sitting there with a trout in a newspaper. And, uh, and Roger goes, well, wh what's that? And Ken's going, the picture editor, there was a fussy picture editor at that time, he, he sent me down to do a story about a, a fish farm, um, and I you know, went all the way down there, took this thing, and he wanted to have a trout leaping out of the water, and I brought one back, and it wasn't quite right. <laughs> he said, I'm not bloody going down there again, so I bought this trout, I'm going to put it on a stick, photograph it against the sky, splash some water over it, <laughs> and then take the stick out. And that's the, I mean, you, you could do that kind of thing, you could remove bits and... Yeah. Um, after processing. Mm. <laughs> well, you know, I was never too concerned with what other photographers were doing. It was really because, you know, in newspapers at the time, Alistair, certain guys, you know, if the picture editor went fishing, the photographer went fishing too. I'm not a fisherman. So, I mean, I just did my own <laughs> pictures like, and uh, I br as I said, I brought things to the paper, which, you know, I mean, if there was a new Red Master bus, I'd probably get the assignment, you know? Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm not that interested in, you know, for me, I realized even from an early stage, how lucky I was to come from a side, to be in London, to be an apprentice in the Daily Mail darkroom, mm -hmm. and to go through all that, and the journey. My camera for me was my kind of encyclopedia. It was just there, it was knowledge. And you see, it's like this, you know, picture of Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon was born in Dublin just a couple of years after Samuel Beckett. These are two monumental figures in the world of culture, Bacon and Beckett. In fact, I think in 1989, I had an exhibition called Bacon, Beckett, and Burroughs, the three Bs. And there was a building society in London called the Bradford and yeah. Bingley Building Society. And I asked them would they sponsor the show, because photographers need sponsorship, but I'd do anyway. And they couldn't get the joke, the three Bs. <laughs> and, um, yeah. you know, I think, in fact, they've gone down the tube since then, of course, but thankfully, I mean, I'm still talking about Bacon, Beckett, and Burroughs, who will live forever. And, of course, Francis and Sam, just interesting because this is one of the, this is, I mean, I've been photographing Bacon since 1971 in Soho because again, Soho with the music, the colony room, it was just one of these places where when you were young and you just, it was just an amazing place. The Flamingo Club, the music, uh, all that stuff. But this is about 1981, it's a Sunday, uh, Sunday morning and I'm going to see Francis and uh, I wanted to, f his studio's been photographed a lot, but I wanted to photograph, we had a cup of coffee in the kitchen and. I want it in the kitchen here, and you can see copies of his, uh, of his work on the wall and the, the fairy liquid and the vim, because allegedly, in fact, he used to clean his teeth with vim occasionally yeah, and blacken his hair. But uh, Product but placement, even but in those days. Yeah, I mean, but I love Bacon because he worked all the time from photography in the same way as I talked about my relationship of it with a, the Athai photograph to Samuel Beckett. There'll never be an occasion with Bacon when, because he was influenced by Edward Mybridge, Mm -hmm. The English photographer well, became an American citizen, who was the, one of the pioneering figures in mo in, uh, in in uh, in motion, sort of mm -hmm. moving moving figures like horses and people, and so Bacon and Mybridge will always be uh, there'll always be that relationship there, you know. But what an incredible man! He's one painter who has his own signature. Very much this period, uh, uh, very much the. Uh, the period of the 60s and the 70s, um, there was an intersect, wasn't there, in London at the time, of, of all the arts, of, mm. of design and culture, in this case of fashion, uh, Yves Saint Laurent, um, uh, sorry, uh, Andy Warhol, um, you've also got an Yves Saint Laurent, I think, uh, mm. in, in this collection. It was, you were very lucky to be at the, the, the right place at the, at the right time. Um, I'm just gonna move on mm. to uh, this, oh, wrong one, going back, that one, there we go. Uh, this one here, because this one is, is not one that I'm aware of. This is uh, taken, in, was it taken in Havana? Taken in Havana. I mean, <coughs> I, I've been to Havana about three times now because uh, the first time I went there, I went to the Cuban National Ballet and, I, and I, 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 I met this lady who's the founder of the Cuban National Ballet called Alicia Alonso. Now, Alicia is as important in a cultural sense as her comrade Fidel is in a revolutionary sense. This woman is now 95 years of, 96 this year, I believe. But the, the Cuban National Ballet did a modern dance version of Waiting for Godot. So I was interested. I wanted to photograph this lady. And of course, they came, they did a tour of Europe in uh, 2010. And this picture was taken in, uh, in Swansea. 
But again, you see the shape of the role. But just, you know, it says what it says. You see Alicia, who in the 30s was a member of the American, Nash, the American Ballet Company. And then, of course, in 1958, when Fidel got rid of the bad guys, he invited her back to Havana, and she created the, national, the, the Cuban National Ballet. And of course, here she is. And I wanted this, this is Alicia by um, a poster. Um, I like to give that sort of, so people it's know what we're looking it's at. It's the hands, you, 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 you do hands, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I like the hands, it's, it's, yeah. it's like the Warhol shot. I mean, the night before that Warhol shot was a party and you know, it's all about snap bumps, this and that and the other. But I, I had said to him, I want a more formal picture because everybody's gonna see the war, the party, the this, the black and white. And I really mean nothing, a lot of them. They're just captions for personalities. But so I, the next day with, this, with Warhol, we had breakfast and uh, I wanted to get shot. But the same with, here with, with, Alicia, uh, with Alicia. I went uh, the last year to see her in Havana with the company. And um, it was just interesting to get her interacting with, with, with the dancers. Like, I mean, it's just, it's just beautiful to, to photograph it. I talked just now about that that moment when you you, you sort of you know you've got the, mm. the image. Um, this one is probably yeah. I mean, yeah, the classic, isn't it? Every just every story is local yeah. to somebody, and of course, you know, I have always I'm always scouring the papers. I'm always I'll buy a copy of the Irish Catholic because there'll be some obscure story I want to photograph. I remember being in the uh, in the Standard this morning in um, September 1980, and there was a story in Nigel Dempster's diary Columnist. saying exactly saying that uh, Prince um, Prince Charles had now relinquished his relationship with Sarah Spencer, but was now courting her younger sister, um, Lady Diana. That was the beginning, and Lady Diana was working, and it said all this in that morning in the sort of just a paragraph, working uh, uh, in a kindergarten in Pimlico, straight down there that morning. I was the first photographer on the scene. At seven, ten, ten past seven in the morning, people, it's a big city, people are leaving off their kids there. So, you know, it's, it wasn't unusual. Knock on the door. And I, I think they were well versed that, you know, the press, the photographers, the media were gonna call. And I wanted to speak to Lady Diana. And of course she came out, you know, uh, what'd you like to do? I said, well, I'd like to photograph you with some of the, some of the children, you know. So now at that morning, the sun was shining down and, she had to get permission, obviously, for, for, from the parents of the, of the two little girls. And um, so I took her into the sunlight. Now, bearing in mind, all my in Ireland, I've always had a, a sort of interest in Marian devotion. When you drive around Ireland, you'll see little shrines at the side of the road of the Madonna and Child. I've always been interested in that. And I photographed that. In the, and when I took out Diana into the sunlight, there's a kind of Madonna-esque sort of sh 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 um, image there, you know, which, which I like actually. And I do, you know, I mean, when I looked through the viewfinder, Alice, I knew at that time, we're not talking about, we're just talking about a Nikon F uh, camera, and I knew I could see the light illuminating her legs. Mm -hmm. This was a vivacious, bubbly teenager mm -hmm. who was going to just, you know, absolutely sort of wreak havoc on the world. Magazines were created, the so-called paparazzi, although that wasn't created, it was created by another man. Um, Visconti, but suddenly this beautiful innocence of youth comes into a situation yeah. and her life is purged. It's youth and, and, and it is, there's no two ways about it, it's youth and it's sexuality. This is a woman who is actually going to bring you know, new life into the royal family and yeah, all yeah, of those. It, to me, she was the human face of the royal family. I had been covering royal events for years. I was forever covering the St. Patrick's Day parade and I always found the Queen Mother gracious. Even when my flash one rainy day didn't go off, she stopped <laughs> while it, seconds it came on again. This is the kind of interesting, but, but suddenly this young woman, um, Lady Diana Spencer, and I knew, I mean, for three weeks, I was on that story. I was watching her and photographing her, but I was the first photographer and I brought her out and we, the Evening Standard was the first paper in the world to put that picture on the first page. Now the funny you thing you formed a kind of a relationship with her. Well, so I did. I got I got to know her, and she yeah. got to know me. At the do, do you know? Did she did she like this photograph? Did well, she, well, I don't know. If she, the, the word "like" never comes into into the situation. What happened was when the picture was taken that morning, and it was sent back by dispatch rider, it appeared on the streets at ten past four, four o'clock, and she was back in her flat, her apartment at the time, and her and her girlfriends who were living with her. This was there, you know, on the table. Mm -hmm. And I gather, um, uh, uh, allegedly, Prince Charles has gone on record saying he didn't realize how beautiful her legs were. 
<laughs> uh, don't believe that for a start. But anyway, that was allegedly somebody, that, that's <laughs> been said, well said. But yeah, I think this was the innocence of the moment. Mm. And I think that's what it projects. And that's what, when I look at the picture, I mean, what happened 17 years down the road is another story. But uh, I remember on one occasion, uh, about a couple of days after this, well, uh, maybe a couple of weeks after this, I w she, was, she was coming out of her apartment and she got into her car and she was driving through London. She ended up in Berkeley Square. And she started crying because it was a massive. Hounded, yeah. She was a massive photographer, and I didn't take a photograph of her because I just I couldn't do that. And I went back, you know, um, to her um, to, to, to her apartment on, in Colherne Mansions in South Kensington, and I had a bunch of flowers. And you know, and what I'm telling you, Alistair, is the truth. I rang the bell. I went across the road because I knew she'd look out the window to see, you know, who he like, you know. So she sees, I'm across the road, she sees me, and she comes downstairs, and she's, she's apologizing for her behavior. She had nothing. I was giving it a bunch of, because, listen, I am not part of that. You know, I mean, you know, I am, I come from a different sensibility to the, what was happening. I mean, you know, today, some photographers are bounty hunters. If somebody has a price on their head, that's about, it's about money. You know, I was, as I said, a thigh, this, my faith, what I believe in. There's certain things you just, you cherish the moment, you don't do it. So Diana was there, and, and at that moment, I, I could have taken pictures, I mean, it's like, you know, but I, I couldn't. But you cherish the moment, and I know it's like, as I'm speaking about her, it's a prayer. And when you have a prayer like that, it's like a star. You're lighting up another star for the good, and we need a lot of good. So I really please, so, that, so the picture for me is really important. The funny thing was, just to sort of end on this picture, when it appeared in the paper, the, the other child down here where Diana's holding uh, her hand or his hand, I can't mm. remember now. Hands again, but yeah. When it appeared in the paper, the standard airbrushed out that other child. Mm. So when you see, uh, when mm. you see the paper, so it's because, you know, because it was a tabloid newspaper, they wanted to give the only impact. So just, the, you know, the Diana holding the child in a sort of Madonna-esque sort of uh, fashion and the airbrushed out, which was the first time I really became kind of familiar about you know um, this kind of business airbrushing because that's the full picture. Well, sticking trout on. Although I still have a copy of the paper on the day, which, and the same image appeared the next day in the Daily Mirror. I have to add my picture, you know, because not everybody managed to get on the scene. You too can learn these uh, techniques because uh, John's going to be giving a masterclass uh, uh, later on, which Mary Jo will tell you about um, shortly. Um, uh, we'll just finish uh, by I'll put up these photographs briefly, not <coughs> not particularly to talk about, but. Uh, because it's a photograph that of Yves Saint Laurent. Doesn't he look hot in those days? Actually, you did a photograph of um, Edna O'Brien on, on that window ledge. That when, I mean, can you imagine Edna O'Brien looking hot? And this man <laughs> managed to... Yeah, Alison, I'm getting to like you more and more all the time. <laughs> I mean, you know, she was hot. There was a time where everyone was hot, you know? <laughs> I mean, we grow old, you know? This, this photograph is one that uh, you actually have an opportunity to win a copy of, a signed copy or a... Uh, yeah, copy yeah, of at yeah, least, and, yeah. that, and, and that's something that, again, that, that Mary Jo will tell you about. Mary Jo, do we have time for questions? Or Okay, uh, if, if anybody has uh, a question for John, now is your moment. There are, as you will recognize, microphones in each of the aisles, so if you want to pop up to one of those uh, microphones, then uh, we'd be very grateful to, um, to welcome your questions. Um, it gives me a chance to... Oh, here we go, right. Hi, uh, as um, somebody from Monastery Avenue, I was very interested to hear your, 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 your experiences of growing up in a thigh. Um, I'd like to know, who do you think today is telling the stories in, photograph in photography? That's a good question. Um, I mean, there's lots, of, I mean, there's lots of people telling stories. I mean, I grew up through Life magazine and Parry Match and those picture magazines like, but uh, now, of course, there's a sort of influx of plasma TV screens everywhere. So. I mean, I went to Brown Thomas there last week, and in the gents' toilets, there's two plasma TV screens boomed into CNN and Fox News. I find it amazing uh, that it should be there. I mean, I'm not really interested at, in those moments. But, this, <laughs> but, but you know, this, I mean, today with, with, with digital cameras, you know, as we speak, in fact, there's photographers in the theater of war in Afghanistan and Bagba in Baghdad and Libya. And these moments are being transmitted as we speak. And they're being sent back to back benches to newspapers. And they're, you know, in my day, there was a certain amount of freedom because when you had the Meg, you were the editor and you were the custodian of what somebody was going to see. 
Um, but you used sometimes to you don't know what people are going to see anymore. It's out there, you know. You used to do that yourself. I mean, again, as a jobbing photographer, we, 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 again, we've talked about uh, you and Roger Bray going down yeah. to uh, Entebbe Airport. Yeah, Entebbe Airport. Uh, within 24 hours of there being a coup to oust Amin and being met, you weren't allowed off the aircraft, but there's clearly been a battle there. There's blood and bullets all over the place. And of course, John takes a photograph of it. There's a big burly Ugandan, this is how Roger Bray tells the story, big burly Ugandan soldier with an automatic weapon, the kind of guy you really don't want to argue with, who's telling you to get back on the plane and wants to confiscate your film. At which point John says, I felt this roll of film being pressed into my hand <laughs> surreptitiously. Mm. And I was thinking, oh, thanks, John. Mm. <laughs> and, and you got away with it. And you managed to get that imagery back to the paper. Mm. And so you've done all that. that well, you, do, you do that. But what the young lady from us, what's your name? Una. Una. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, when Maggie Thatcher's son went missing in the Sahara Desert, right, uh, I was sent over there for about four, I think it was about ten days, and, you know, Mr. Mark Thatcher was eventually found, but of course you're waiting all the time, because the, the reporters, Alistair, could go to bed after drinking very bad Algerian wine, <laughs> but I had to stay up all night talking to my friends, like, to make sure that I, you know, when the opportunity came, I was going to be there. And eventually, uh, one morning at three o'clock, my friends started shaking me. They found Mr. Thatcher, and I was there. And of course, Mark Thatcher's father had come over as well. This was in um, Taman Rasset, you know, about 30 miles from Timbuktu. What an amazing byline that is, you know, <laughs> being in Timbuktu. But anyway, eventually got the photographs of Mark Thatcher and his father. Um, then I had to get out of there to go to Al uh, Algiers to process, develop the film. I can't speak French. So I had all these kind of problems. But more important, I had to tell, you know, because I was so acquainted with the Algerian generals, I had to tell them, I have to get back to Algiers. I work for an evening newspaper. We have to get this on the front page. And I remember at the airport, them dragging two people off the aircraft so I could get on the aircraft <laughs> and get my film back. <laughs> right. These are little moments. But there's always, you know, people out there and there's young photographers, men and women, and some of them are casualties of war now, in fact. You know, and um, so it's happening all the time because it's like, Unfortunately, we, there's so much happening. We know about it all the time, as we do now. It's there. It's out there, you know? One more question over here. Thank you so much for sharing some amazing stories. I really appreciate it. Um, my name's Mary Ellen, and my blog is Breathe, Dream, Go. And I spend a lot of time in India. And I often want to photograph people who I see, but, I, you know, I feel shy. So can you talk about how to photograph people when you're traveling, and, and how much time do you need to make a connection with them, or any other tips? Mary Ellen, what I find, wherever I go, in fact, there's always a bicycle in the pictures. And I, I always found something, you know, if somebody, like in Havana, I was in New Delhi some years ago, and the bicycle, I was watching a man polishing his bicycle. And I, I you know, I had a bicycle. We all had bicycles, you know. I still have a bicycle, actually. Can't get on it now so easy. <laughs> but, uh, but sometimes the introduction, if you find a common sort of thing, thread where you know you're you know you're out there and you're taking a picture of somebody's bicycle then they want to engage you because suddenly you know the camera is not as frightening anymore like i find with the roliflex when people um like earlier on this year um the chic uh, fashion outlet care took me to los angeles because they wanted me to take some photographs in the old black and white school of um the black and white movie makers you know and um, there's a society, it's an Irish-American society, and they call it Oscars Wild, as opposed to the Oscars. It was on the Thursday. And there was all the luminaries turned up, and Mr. Spielberg, but Warren Beatty turned up with his wife, and he saw the roller plate. He said, gee, I haven't seen one of them for years. But immediately, he felt at ease. Now, that's what happens. When you're going to and you're traveling, Look at the bicycle and literature, you know, where it goes to. But also, if you have that connection, people are interested in, con not just in sort of, as, as a voyeur, stealing their soul, so to speak, but engage them, make them feel important. Because we live in a vanity world today, and our souls are stolen constantly and deleted at the flip of a button. We only keep sometimes what we want to keep, and that's not always the best. So, you know, it's wonderful if you engage yourself with the people you're, you're photographing. Maybe, you know, like you're interested in bicycles or maybe you like somebody's potted plants or something like that, you know. It works for me, uh, Mary Ellen. You know, it's funny you should say that. I just had the opportunity to interview Derv Murphy and, and her bike, Roz, was a kind of central image in yeah. the interview. That's 
so. Exactly. Well, I know Dervlin, of course. She's one, you know, having photographed Irish writers. I mean, Dervlin, I have a sequence of photographs now called Poets on Bikes. <laughs> so I've got various poets. Um, and of course, Dervlin is one of them, and she writes poetry as well. But uh, on her bike, she took to Afghanistan. I mean, you couldn't say, you couldn't go there to learn a bicycle, oh, no, could you? No, she went all the way to Delhi. And uh, where, where? She went all the way to Delhi. Oh, fantastic. That's brilliant. Oh, that's great. No, bicycle, I like that. The bike in, 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 uh, in literature is, is good. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't see anybody else standing at the mic. So, ladies and gentlemen, John Minahan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alistair. Thank you.